All right, everybody, thank you for coming. We're really excited to host today. Uh, we have 10 candidates for public advocate, uh, which is not all of the candidates actually for public advocate, but we had to, to cap it at 10. Uh, here in Staten Island, it's really important for us to give the residents of Staten Island an opportunity to look under the hood and you know, for a position that many people say is the second most powerful position in the city of New York, a position that has given us the current mayor, and the current Attorney General, or the, the uh, incoming Attorney General of the State of New York. And so this is a really important position, and we wanted to give Staten Islanders an opportunity uh, to uh, hear from them, hear from the candidates. And so before we get started, uh, a little bit about myself. I, I'm Robbie Gupta, the co-founder of The Arena. We're an organization that's supported candidates all around the country. And uh, I'm born and raised in Staten Island. My family's been here. I don't know, mom can tell you, many generations uh, grew up in Travis and in Westerly, and I, like you, have watched a long generation of candidates coming through here and ignoring us. And so uh, it's really important for us to hold their feet to the fire, uh, get, extract those promises from them so that when they get elected, they keep coming through and then remember our faces and our names. Um, with that, uh, this is, I'm not going to talk a lot about the arena, but we sponsored this along with a ton of organizations in Staten Island. I'm going to shout some of them out. Staten Island Women's March, uh, the uh, Staten Island Urban Center, Staten Island Latinx, uh, Dream Action Coalition, Young Democrats of Richmond County, the African Leadership Group, Move Forward Staten Island, Staten Island Interreligious Leadership Council, the Staten Island NAACP Youth Council, and Sustainable Staten Island. So let's give it up all of them. So, um, we're going to get started just by giving each of our candidates an opportunity to uh, explain who they are and what they believe in, and then we're going to ask uh, a series of questions that each candidate will have about two minutes to answer, and then we'll do uh, a series of questions that, of statements that candidates can identify with or not. So raise their hand if they identify with a statement or not. And because of the... Uh, the timing, you know, we're at the holidays on Thursday night, and because of the fact that we have a decent amount of candidates, we won't have as much time for interaction within this session as possible, but we do uh, want to invite you, if there's something that you hear in particular that you want to follow up on, some of our candidates might hang out outside after this uh, Q&A uh, as the other group comes in, so we have six coming in the next round. So uh, I invite you to ask questions directly of candidates after this. Uh, you also can email me on Robbie at the arena run. That's R A V I at the arena run, and I promise you, we will hassle candidates for follow-up answers to questions for you. So if you have a question for a candidate that you really want to get an answer, and if they have to slip out to another event, we will uh, get that question to them and keep following up until we get an answer for you. So with that, um, I'm going to uh, introduce our first. Uh, a few panelists. Uh, I want to thank you for coming to Staten Island. Um, I know some of you have been here many times before. Uh, we have uh, Michael, uh, first starting on my left, we have Michael here, Michael Zablaskis, who's former chairman of the Manhattan Independence Party. Uh, we have Don Smalls, who's an attorney who previously worked in the Obama and Clinton administrations. Um, we have Theo Chino, who's a Bitcoin entrepreneur and county committee member. And then we have uh, Melissa Mark Viverito, our former speaker of the city council. Um, and so when I said second most powerful position, she might disagree. Uh, <laughs> that, that position might, might be, as it, as at least is in the running for that title. So um, I will start by giving uh, Michael an opportunity just to uh, talk about who he is and, and what he's running for. Good evening. Uh, my name is Michael Zabluskis, and I want to be your next public advocate. And the reason why is. I want to help people. I've always helped people throughout my life. I'm an independent, not a Democrat, not a Republican. I am I'm somebody that I want practical solutions. Not out ideological, practical. Because right now, too much of our politics, people are saying, I'm left, I'm right. And a lot of times, neither party's solutions are working. So I think it's important, especially for the public advocate, to have an independent. Because we saw what happened with the DOI head, Mr. Peters, getting fired. And we need, the public advocate is supposed to hold all politicians, all agencies, to uh, work well. And that's not. 
we have to have somebody with investigative ability, and the public ethically does have it. It's a little roundabout way because I don't have subpoena power, but we can do that. I can go in and demand from the agencies, okay, like NYJA, how that White's uh, failing us so bad. And it's not just because, because of money, it's definitely because of mismanagement. One of the things I think is ridiculous is with the MTA. Why are we repairing stations when we should be fixing the signal system? Because it, that's mismanagement. We have, you know, they say they need $15 billion. We're spending close to $8 billion on rehabbing stations. People will put up with bad stations if the trains are running on time. These are simple, direct s solutions that we can start instituting. I want to be your public advocate because I think I'll do a great job, especially being an independent, and I have tremendous ideas on all kinds of issues, uh, from schools, MTA, and my time is up. Thank you. <laughs> Um, my name is Dawn Smalls, and this is not how I normally start off, but I want to say I'm a proud Democrat because I want to distinguish myself from my fellow, uh, uh, my fellow candidate over here. And I am a mom, I am an attorney, and I'm a first-time candidate. And I come to this race with over two decades of experience in law, philanthropy, government, and politics with uh, experience in two Democratic presidential administrations. In the Clinton administration, I was assistant to White House Chief of Staff, John Podesta, and during the Obama administration, I was the Chief Regulatory Officer at HHS, um, where I was part of the team that implemented the Affordable Care Act, which gave health care to millions of Americans. Um, I believe, I am running for public advocate because I believe New Yorkers deserve an independent uh, public advocate, and I have to use my my words carefully um, <laughs> next to Michael over here, who is an independent, um, but somebody who is uh, truly independent, uh, not only of the mayor, um, but also the governor and the local political structure. Um, I come to this race with the experience, the know-how, and the wherewithal um, to push through the bureaucracy. And again, the public advocate, by definition, is a role that is supposed to be the check on how well city services are provided to New York City residents. You can't do that unless you know how the bureaucracy and how city government works. And you need somebody that is truly independent of the mayor um, and the current political structure um, to get things done. I will note, and I probably won't be the only one, uh, that right now with Tish James being elevated to the Attorney General's office, uh, that the mayor, the comptroller, and the city council speaker are all white men. Um, I think it is very important for New York, which is a leader of a national progressive agenda, um, to elect a woman. This is not a situation where you have, um, you don't have a bevy of qualified candidates. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over. Thank you. Uh, my name is Theo Chino. Uh, I'll start with the website. We have to get the marketing out. So you can get all the answers and you can contact me at teochino.com and that's where you will find my platform. Uh, I have a very extensive platform because I'm a Democrat and to be able to run a city you need to have ideas. And those ideas you get them to go into clubs and being active talking to other Democrats to see how we can make this city better. Then once you have a good idea, you put it on paper and you decide to run. So here I am, I want to be the next public advocate because I'm a technologist. And as a technologist and as an activist, I've been going to many of the leaders uh, around the city talking about how important is technology within city government. It's everywhere. And like we learned from John Podesta, when you don't pay attention, suddenly you get a big crisis when all the email gets back. I mean, you, you cannot... So, Basically, the, the public advocate is also the chair of a committee called the COPIC. Is the, uh, how do you call that platform? I always forget the long name. But COPIC is basically in charge of all the open data that all the agency needs to share with the, city of, of, with the citizen of the city of New York. So as a chair, that committee needs to meet more often. And as a public advocate, I want to dig into how all the agency are run 
share their data, and interact with all the citizens. So there is about 30 problems we have to fix. They're all on my website, and two minutes is very short to introduce each other. So I'm Tio Chino, and check my website. Uh, good evening, buenas noches. Uh, my name is Melissa Marviverito, and I hope uh, that after tonight, I will have earned the trust to get your support as I run for public advocate. Uh, today, we kicked off my uh, campaign ad, which basically starts off by saying, and I would hope that people would go and take a look at it, that for me, it's not about politics, it's about making change. And that is what my life trajectory, whether an activist before being an elected official, and my 12 years as a council member, four years as speaker, it's all been about making change, about utilizing the trust that voters have put in me and that my colleagues put in me to make sure that we make government be responsive to us as citizens, as people that live in the city of New York. That's what I want to do as public advocate. It's a different role, I understand the distinction, but looking at the record of success as being an immigrant rights advocate and making sure we pass laws and legislation and initiatives that demonstrate that New York City is a welcoming, inclusive, and sanctuary city. Whether it is reforming our criminal justice system by demanding closing Rikers, going against the mayor, going against the police commissioner and the corrections commissioner, going against that and making now to a point where everybody is talking about closing Rikers. I have a track record of success. I am a progressive who at my heart believes in equity and justice, and what can I do to utilize the trust that has been placed in me to make government responsive more and, and making sure that New York City is a more welcoming and inclusive city. So I hope you take a look at the, the campaign uh, website and check that out. The other thing is, this is a five borough campaign. Today, by the end of the day, I will have visited all five boroughs. I am talking to communities and constituencies to hear from them how they believe this office can best serve them. I want to champion, right, MTA. I want to make sure that we get more money and revenue into improving our transportation infrastructure. I want to make sure that we're talking about our public housing residents in NYCHA. That is what I will do in this position, is continue that trajectory of success, not just beating my chest, but making sure that we make change happen. I hope that I can earn your trust and get your vote uh, whenever the election is called. <laughs> We solicited questions from community groups uh, within Staten Island and around the city, and uh, the most common response we got from folks as we asked questions was, uh, I'm not sure what to ask because I'm not sure whether this position should exist. And so, uh, and obviously the city council, there are members of the city council who have been pushing uh, on that point. And so I figured it would be good to, we could pretend that there's an empty chair there for the position of let's get rid of the public advocate position and let's debate that point before we even get started. Why should this position exist and uh, and you could use you know, historically that's why it has been important, but more importantly I think folks would like to hear what will you do with the position of public advocate uh, to actually help answer that question and assuage people's concerns and you could start us off. You know. We just went through a historic uh, midterm cycle, right, where people are demanding greater accountability and transparency from government. This office is an office that demands accountability and transparency and serves as an independent watchdog from the mayor and the city council. So anybody that calls for its elimination is asking for less democracy, right, and less accountability and transparency from government. So I do believe that the position needs to actually exist, but it should also be strengthened. You did mention the DOI situation, right? Well, a perfect opportunity, Department of Investigation should be, right, possibly in the public advocate's office. Um, when you look at the controller, they have a fiscal responsibility, um, an oversight. The public advocate should be more like the administrator, right, how the city is run, agency, services. So the idea of creating more accountability and transparency is critical, and I think that that position should remain for that, uh, for, for that to take effect. Well, uh, I'll say that I agree with you, Melissa, on that, and I'll add that the position is the voice of the voiceless, mm -hmm. the one who, 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 are mis who are not represented. And I think I was one of those voiceless person for the last 20 years. I went to your office, I went to many offices of city council, I knock at the door, and it is like a mountain, it's climbing a mountain. And I discovered that climbing the mountain was like, sometimes speaking against a wall. 
and suddenly this position, if it's felt, if it's well held by someone who can speak for the voiceless, at least New York City will, uh, there is a lot that this position can do. Um, so I'm still, I'm a candidate, but I'm also still a voter, and let me just start off by saying um, I do think that you should get rid of the public advocate's office if it's just going to be a trial run for mayor. Um, if that's what the office is, I don't think that it should continue to exist. If it is what it's supposed to be, what it was intended to be, which is an independent uh, check and evaluator of how well the mayor and city government is, is providing services to New Yorkers, I think that's an important role. What I would do as public advocate is reorganize the office so that it focused on a few key issues, a team of people that focused on them all day, every day, uh, the subway, affordable housing, homelessness, and voting reforms. And these people, if there's a deliverable miss, if there's a funding stream that stopped, uh, you would know about it right away uh, with a team of people that would come up with a solution or at least start a public dialogue. And that's the only way that we're going to make progress around some of these really, really intractable issues that are critical to the, the, to the functioning of our city. The office should definitely exist. <clears throat> Excuse me. The problem is we've had the wrong people. They were more concerned about getting to a higher office than they were about actually doing the job. There's a number of key uh, powers of the public advocate that are extremely important. And it's even more extremely important to have a diverse voice. As they said, they're all saying, well, I'm a Democrat, I believe in, you know, Progressivism, well, sometimes progressivism doesn't work. You want somebody else in there. And one of the keys I want to do with the public advocates is save our pension system. Our leaders have been lying to us because pensions are no longer guaranteed. So many federal court systems. They always say that the, public, uh, the New York City Pension Fund is the best run in the country. Well, it is. However, it's still only 65% funded. I will have a seat on the pension board and stop the nonsense that they're trying to do and make all our investors, investments progressive and not worrying about the fiduciary responsibility to our retirees and future retirees. These are some of the reasons that the public advocate's office should exist. Also, going back to DOI, if you have a, a, somebody appointed to the DOI's office that is just a yes man to the mayor, then who's going to do anything? Also, if people don't realize that, that Scott Stringer right now is actually abusing his powers. He is actually reviewing things, he's go, reviewing things operationally. He doesn't have that power. The charter says he only has the power to say if the money's there, is there corruption in the procurement, or the corruption with the company. We need somebody that knows the system. I work for the city, and I know the city system. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so this next question comes from uh, Staten Island Women who march. Uh, Staten Islanders have some of the longest daily commutes in the country. We have limited rail service and are the only borough with no subways, uh, subway connecting us to the rest of the city. Express bus service to Manhattan is inadequate and unreliable, and while the mayor has promised new fast ferries for every borough, somehow Staten Island was left out of that plan. Improving transportation could vastly improve the lives and job prospects of Staten Island's half a million residents. As public advocate, what will you do to ensure that Staten Island gets its fair share of New York City's transportation resources? Well, one of the things I would do is I would uh, try to build some light rail systems to help connect the Staten Island to the ferry and other sections. Light rail is much cheaper than a subway system and can be built much quicker. Uh, it's being done all over the world and all over this country right now. And that would definitely help Staten Island. Um, I would all, like I said, I work for DOT, so I know uh, some about the ferry system. I think we should push for Staten Islanders to get better ferry service from all sides of the island. And I think that can be done. It can be done relatively cheaply compared to other modes of transportation. So there, uh, we just have to find the money and actually reallocate some of the money from some of these boondoggles that are going on. I mean, when you look at what happened with the Second Avenue subway and the contracts in the MTA, 
they had 22 people running the boring machine. You know the rest of the world has four. That includes San Francisco. You're talking unionized people. And these jobs are paying well over $100,000 a year before overtime. They were sitting around doing nothing. We need to go into there and say, hey, wait a minute, stop some of these contracts, uh, uh, boondoggles for some union members and everything else. We cannot afford to continue paying this type of money thinking that, you know, we can, it's New York City, so we don't have to care. Well, San Francisco, they build stuff a lot cheaper than this. Paris, uh, Germany, they, they all spend a lot less money. They're big cities, too. We just say, well, it's New York, we're going to spend it. Uh, the procurement process is a nightmare. I mean, people like Melissa think that the MWBEs, uh, women minority businesses, putting them into the contracts actually help minority businesses. It actually doesn't. It actually prevents them because the procurement system is so not not it's a bunch of nonsense actually. Don't. All right. On that note, um, so uh, I already started off a little bit. Um, one of my signature issues, the, the four primary issues that I'm highlighting as part of my campaign, and the first one is the subway, um, just because I think it's such a critical issue um, in terms of the basic functioning of our city. And two, it's an issue of equity, um, because not everybody can jump on an alternate mode of transportation or afford a taxi or an Uber if the subway breaks down. So New York City does not function if the public transit transit system does not work. Um, I, you talked a little bit about how the express, the, the improvements on the bus service didn't come to Staten Island. I think that's a very concrete thing that the next public advocate um, can push for. I think bus service in general is something that you can make progress on sooner rather than later um, in comparison to larger scale infrastructure uh, improvements like the Second Avenue subway. So again, I would have a team of people in my office that were, um, that's all they did, um, was the subway with an eye to how it was working in each borough and make sure to take an eye um, towards that Island. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's a tough question for Staten Island. Uh, as a worker in Staten Island, I used to go from St. George to uh, Cable Street, Cable Way. Uh, so I remember at the time they were talking about the North Shore rail system, so that would go with the light work. But the way to build transportation in Staten Island is to ask the community to work with us. And as a public advocate I am, I would be a believer of asking the community to sit down with their community board and start utilizing the transportation committee inside the community board and figure out what is right for this borough. How do we want the transportation to be built? Because I have a basic idea, but I don't live here. You live here. So you have to decide together how we can build the transportation and get the money out of the MTA to say we need to include Staten Island. But we need to figure out the plan. And so we need to sit together. And that's what I would uh, emphasize, is put together small commission within the community board and try to hammer it out until we figure out how to make Staten Island good for the next 30 years to come? Uh, that's basically very vague, but uh, I'm sorry for that. I have to agree with, um, with Dawn on, on the issue of making MTA a priority and I've been making it a signature issue as well. I completely agree that when we talk about the working class and the working poor in the city that rely and our expensive transportation system to begin with, as their only source of, of transportation with limited options, we have to make this an ultimate priority. Um, to, for the quality of life of New Yorkers. When you think about uh, families have to wake up earlier, right, because they don't know the reliability of the system, kids having to get to school much earlier, right, people maybe possibly that are being paid by the hour and do not, do not have uh, good uh, employers, that if you miss an hour of work or you're getting late to work, it could impact uh, your livelihood. These are realities that we're living. We have areas in the city of New York that we call transportation deserts, where there has been a lack of investment in those areas and is therefore much more difficult and challenging to go about your daily life. So for me, the MTA is critically important that we make that a signature issue. Um, and I have been a supporter of, let's go back to 2008, right, when I supported congestion pricing when I was in the city council, way overdue, we still have not passed it in the city of New York, 
That revenue alone will not be enough to cover the infrastructure and capital needs of the MTA. There are definitely issues on the operational side, mismanagement, etc. But the capital infrastructure needs of the MTA, we need an infusion of money. We have to figure out where we're going to find those additional sources of revenue. So I have proposed, and we talked about it last week, because of the importance of the transportation system, particularly to the working class communities and, and those who are lower income and definitely need the transportation system, we need for rails. Right? I believe in the legalization of marijuana. I believe that that should happen. We have a governor that has said he supports it. Now we have a state democratic party, a uh, state democratic senate. Let's make it happen. More revenue will be invested in the capital infrastructure needs of the MTA. The remainder of it be invested in communities that have been disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs and create opportunities. Um, and that is what I have proposed getting a lot of debate. I'm going to continue to put forward ideas to engage in that. But areas, so the areas that have had historical disinvestment in transportation infrastructure need to be at the top of the list also when we think about how we um, continue to make improvements and making sure that we expand opportunities into those areas that have been dis disproportionately disinvested in. Thank you very much. Uh, and Don, why don't you start us off on this next question. This question was uh, submitted by the Staten Islanders Against Racism and Police Brutality. Uh, it has been reported that the NYPD maintains a gang database. Local community groups here on Staten Island have raised questions about the transparency of that database. What will you do as public advocate to reform that system, and what else will you do to improve the relationship between the NYPD and communities of color? So when I hear that question, I think about um, Jasmine Headley, um, who was uh, the 23-year-old mother that was seeking um, child care assistance and had her baby yanked um, out of her arms, um, which for me is um, a continued pattern of law enforcement, uh, whether it be on the border or in New York City, um, uh, failing to acknowledge the basic humanity of black and brown communities. So um, I think that that is just at the root. You cannot um, do what they did to her. Um, and I do that. I saw that video not only as a black woman, but I saw that video of a mother of um, three small children. And I don't believe that you can do that to another human being unless you see them as less than. And so that just fundamentally is a problem um, with uh, law enforcement. Um, and I think fundamentally, uh, the, at least the law enforcement that were in that room, and I think it's a lack of moral leadership um, that the mayor could not come out and just say that what, what, what happened and what occurred on that video um, was wrong. So. Um, I don't know much specifically about the gang uh, database, but I do think that there is an overarching issue in terms of how law enforcement engages with communities of color um, and a lot of pre-existing, um, uh, I won't even call it prejudice, but um, there are a lot of issues there that need to be dealt with just in terms of how they engage um, with black and brown communities in general um, that we need to work on. Thank you, Theo. Well, that's my question here, the database. Well, uh, we'll start with, we need to delete it. Simple as that, uh, very quickly. And we need to start again. And there is a bill that was put in the City Council uh, last year and that has been put forward together. It's called the POST Act, the Police Oversight of Technology something, Act. And that act requires us for the NYPD to disclose all the technology that they use to track their citizen. And the thing is, he, he, nobody wants to talk about it really, because the, the thing is, the police wants to do their stuff, and Melissa was at city council, and I was waiting for, for something to happen. Jumani got arrested in 2011. 2011, I believe, he got, when he was a city councilman, the NYPD knocked him down because they went after him. And in all this time, we're still debating that. When the cops arrested me when I was 17 in front of my building, putting a gun in my head, the problem still exists 30 years later. So we need to have, to start to talk about demilitar demilitarizing the police. Start to, to get them to be engaged as a community actor instead of this, this paramilitary thing that can tell the mayor 
to F off and whatever. We need to have a police that is part of the community, that is engaged with the community, and that tries to fix it. But we have a, another thing I'm thinking about out loud suddenly. is like the mayor is absent. The Manhattan DA is taking the role of the mayor in doing stuff with the police. Instead of prosecuting, he decides who goes to jail and whatever. So there is a lot of systemic problems that we need to fix. And the first part is starting with the demilitarization of the NYPD. You know, th this is a, it's an incredibly important issue and, and I have serious concerns with any sort of database because you have to figure out like what are the definitions they are utilizing, right? To then figure out what they're sticking into this database. So I, there's questions and I think that has to, there has to be a lot more transparency and accountability with regards to that matter or whether or not a database of that type needs to exist. That's part of the debate and part of the hearing. You know, being in the city council prior to being speaker, you know, a lot of the movement and advances that we have been able to make when it comes to holding the police more accountable uh, is through the activism at the grassroots. So the engagement that people have made over time to demand change has resulted in some change. The reality is that similar to any institution in this country, our educational system, our criminal justice system, whatever, there is systemic racism. There are biases, internalized biases that people have in times of any, in, in any profession that they have. And the police officers are not immune to that, right? So there has been this conversation of having uh, a biased training and going through different types of training, changing the handbook, making sure that we pass laws to get more information, which the NYPD has defied. One of the things a public advocate can do, right? I have to look at the scope and of the responsibilities of the position, but there are lawsuits that you can engage in, right? You can look at what laws have been implemented, what laws are in place, and whether or not the city agencies are complying with what has been passed into law. That again, through power of hearings, Right, through the oversight that this uh, uh, position has, that is something that we can continue to engage in, again, from the perspective of a public advocate. Yeah, I, I understand very the, much the distinction and the difference between the positions, because being the leader of a legislative body where you have to deal with 50 other individuals who are voting or have an opinion on issues, sometimes you're not able to carry something as far as you would like to take it because you've got to be able to get the consensus or get the majority of the people involved. So there's a lot of that can be done. I have serious concerns about the database, uh, but there is ways that the public advocate can demand greater accountability and making sure that the different city agencies are complying with the laws that are already on the books. This is a job of the public advocate. He actually has the power to go in and check out what they're using the database. And he can force the police to do it, even if I have to go to court for freedom of information. Because it says in the charter, if a citizen has a complaint, uh, the public advocate gets to go into these different agencies and actually review it. Now, I can't say whether the database is good or not, because I haven't seen it. Um, you know, I, I don't buy into this systemic racism and everything. I'm sorry. I know people say that. Go ahead. I grew up as a military brat. I didn't. Yeah, I didn't even know people had problems with interracial marriages, and that was in the '60s. Is there racism? Yes. Okay. Fine. I, I don't care. I, I understand that. I travel into every neighborhood. I've helped people in every neighborhood. Is there racism? Yes. Is there problems? But sometimes it's the way the law is designed and the way things are operational. Mr. Mm -hmm. Walker Day in my shoes. Exactly. Okay, I have actually. Believe it or not. I've been the minority in a lot of areas. I, I, went to my, I was actually part of busing in the 70s. I got bused into majority black and majority Hispanic uh, schools in the 70s. Huh? Uh, yes. yes, I did. Well, actually, no, it was a mixed neighborhood. I didn't live in a uh, uh, pure white neighborhood. Most of the time I lived on base, which is uh, was a mixed neighborhood. But that's fine. Uh, yeah, I understand a lot of people think that. Uh, but I, I, there is racism. I'm not denying that. But I'm not saying it's systemic. I think there's a lot of problems. And I have a criminal justice reform package that I think will solve a lot of that. 
Well, yeah, that's fine. You, I, I lost a lot of you, but that's fine. If you don't want to listen, that's fine. Yeah, sure. But there's a lot of things that can be changed and a lot of things that if you actually listen and, uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, really, thank you. You should really listen. I was, that's fine. I was worried that we weren't on style for a second and then I thought everybody's woken up. Well, uh, so, uh, this, uh, we, our next series of questions are yes and no questions, just so you can raise your hand if you identify with the statement uh, or not. Um, the, we'll try to make them as clear as possible so that they're not like, they don't require an expansive description. So uh, this, is, uh, the, this is our lead into the first two questions from Staten Island in March. Uh, in Staten Island, there are neighborhoods where the local schools are wholly inadequate at educating our children, yet the families have no other options that would enable the children to get a quality education often. Opponents of school choice focus on restricting choice for low-income families while leaving untouched our vast system of neighborhood preferences and private and magnet schools. So two questions. Uh, you can raise your hand if you identify with this statement. And I'll repeat it twice because I don't want to get anybody in trouble here. Raise your hand if something I don't believe. Uh, raise your hand if you support the expanding discovery program, uh, the mayor's program to reform admissions at specialized high schools. So there's a particular announcement that the mayor made around um, reforming the admissions at our magnet school. Raise your hand if you support that. Um, um, so you, I said I'll read it twice. So raise your hand if you support the expanding discovery program, the mayor's program to reform the admissions at specialized high school. I don't support it as is. I think. The concept I support. The way it's being implemented is really not necessary. Cool. I guess I'm not it's hard to. It's hard to. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. It's you can make those. Yeah, this is not, you know, you don't have to stay overly formal, you know, feel free to explain yourselves. Uh, second is raise your hand if you support the expansion of public charter schools. If you support the expansion of public charter schools. Um, all right. Uh, third question, uh, and this is on a totally different issue. So uh, raise your hands, and I'll read this one twice. Raise your hands if you think the mayor had adequate grounds to fire the commissioner of the Department of Investigations, Mark Peters. So raise your hand if you think the mayor had adequate grounds to fire the commissioner of the Department of Investigation, Mark Peters. Uh, fourth, uh, raise your hand if you've publicly criticized the mayor by name in the past year. If you've publicly criticized the mayor by name in the past year. Uh, the fifth is raise your hand if you endorsed pre-primary uh, challengers to the Independent Democratic Caucus uh, Conference who are Democrats who caucus with the Republicans. So raise your hand if you endorsed pre-primary challengers to the Independent Democratic Conference, Democrats who caucus with the Republicans, the challengers to those folks. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> the challengers, so like Biagi, Ramos, Zellner Murray, Robert Jackson, yeah, yeah, yeah. John Liu, yeah. Um, my, my answer is no, but I was prohibited from supporting the challengers. I was really excited about what you were about to say for a second there. Um, well, yeah. I support all of them. I endorse two of them. Okay. No, they're not all. Got it. Uh, so, uh, raise your hand if you think uh, Officer Daniel uh, Pantaleo should remain on the job. Uh, raise your hand if you think Officer Daniel Pantaleo, uh, I don't know I'm pronouncing his last name, uh, should remain on the job. This is the officer who, who wants to explain. Uh, there you go. Uh, so, still working? Yes. Uh, so, do you think, if, raise your hand if you think you should stay on the job. I really haven't been following it as much. Uh, I haven't seen. I, I have to follow the court case and the internal review. I'd have to look at what they said on the internal review. Uh, I can't. Say, it's a maybe right now. Legal case on Staten Island. They can't say here today without knowing what it was or what. Oh no, I know what it was, but I haven't reviewed the internal documents from the police department. Uh, and I, I want to give everybody a fair shot and not just what I read in the press. I've been misreported in the press video. too. We should put the video on the screen. That's fun. All right. I understand. I just like what happened, but I want to see you. So one more yes or no question. Um, it is. Yeah, okay. One more yes or no question for our 
uh, for our folks, and then we'll give everybody an opportunity to close. Uh, and uh, so this one, the reason why we're asking this this final question is because it was brought up by nearly every group we had. We constantly heard from folks that were worried that this position was being used as a stepping stone and not substantively. And so the question uh, that a lot of folks asked us to ask is, uh, raise your hand if you pledge not to run for mayor in 2021 if you win this election. So raise your hand if you pledge not to run for mayor in 2021 if you win this election. All right. So uh, in closing, we'd like to give everybody an opportunity. Um, and Athea, I think you're the only one who hasn't gone first. So why don't you go first on this one? Uh, give everybody an opportunity to close. And uh, what we would love to hear is if you have any particular special connection to the island. And it's OK if, if you have a special connection to the island that you'd love to just bring into your closing statement. Um, any experience here? Well, if one day you woke up five minutes late after the change of time uh, because you were a Time Warner Cable customer, that was me. Uh, because I used to work at the at 100 Cable Way and I ran all the cable box for all of Staten Island. And when you had your please wait, that was me. And basically that was it. Until they laid me off because they, they, uh, they integrated with Charter, uh, Time Warner Cable and Charter and I was one of the Spectrum laid off. So that's my connection with the island. I lived on St. George. Uh, my wife took the ferry every day to work uptown, and I would take the S40 to go to uh, Cable Way. That's my connection with the island. Uh, in, I, I wanted to close. I'm a technologist, as you can see. I ran the back end of Time Warner Cable. I know about database. I love database. And one question as an activist is, there was the, I wanted to close asking a question to Melissa, because in Manhattan, the Post Act, she was the only councilwoman not to sign on into the Post Act to get the police to disclose their technology. And this is the first time I have this opportunity to ask you in person why you couldn't sign it and put it on the floor for a general vote past the committee. That's my question. And so in closing, that's, I would be the, the voice of the voiceless. Um, Check out my website, teochino.com, pubadvocate.nyc. I need volunteer. Please join my campaign. Uh, I need help to get on the ballot, so I will need petitioner. And that's, I wish you look at my website, because there is much more to me than uh, three minutes uh, uh, hazy introduction. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you for being here. And please join your county committee if you're a Democrat or Republican. We need to change the way the party works. So join your local county committee and uh, and um, check out everything and check the, the candidate. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you for the opportunity to come here. When I served as speaker, um, I worked very closely with each, each and every one of my colleagues to make sure that I was listening to the concerns that they had in their particular districts and figure out ways that I could be supportive of them in their districts. I visited Staten Island many times. Uh, having supported all three of the council members, despite the fact that two are Republican. My responsibility is to be supportive of all constituencies throughout the city. And so visited many times and helped allocate resources, not only to the parks, but also to um, Rumsey, in terms of understanding we don't have a public hospital in Staten Island that is truly a problem. We did allocate more resources to Rumsey in order to help fix the emergency room. A lot of services and a lot of, of listening that I did with each of the respective colleagues to figure out ways that we could bring more services to the island. So I am familiar with some of the challenges, I've developed relationships. I'll say this as a way of contextualizing the last question that was asked and by not raising my hand. You know, I don't speak, and I, I try not to speak in absolutes in certain situations, right? I never projected that I was going to run for public advocate. I never know, and you never know what life is going to throw in front of you. I'm not going to stand before a group of people and say something that is expected, or what you want me to say, or what you want to hear from me, right? I don't, I'm not that type of politician, right? I am an elected official. I'm, uh, I have been an elected official. I will be an elected official. That is very much about being transparent, open, and honest. You may not end, not like end up, you may not like where I end up, but I will explain to you my position and why I feel I've arrived at the position that I feel is best. Right after listening extensively. So I don't know where my life is going to be five years from now. I don't know where my life is going to be three years from now. I don't know what it will be in ten years from now. 
So I say I leave things open in, in that sense, and that's I think the best and most honest answer I can give to all of you. I hope that I can earn your trust based on my experience and my trajectory of accomplishment in the city council. That I hope you see my my uh, campaign video, which speaks a little bit about my background, mnv.nyc, and you can get a sense of who I am and what I stand for and what kind of public advocate I will be. And I hope that I can earn your vote and your trust um, and be the best. Uh, the next and the best public advocate for the city of New York. Thank you. I will always be honest with you, even if it's in the, you know, people will hate me for it. I'm an honest person, have always been. And as you saw, most people attack me on what I thought on the racism. Because here's, let me explain a little bit more, because I don't think it's as much racism as it is poverty. Because uh, most of my family is from uh, the Strand, Pennsylvania area. And we are not rich. And guess what? A lot of my cousins ended up in jail and beat up by cops just the same. So a lot more of it is the poverty angle. Now, like I said, I do agree there is racism. I just don't think it's as systemic as people making it out to be. I think that there needs to be more communication to get all communities to work together. Because right now, they're not communicating. I think I might be able to do that because I do have that ability to go into different groups and work with them. I've done it all my life. Most of the candidates I've helped throughout the last 30 years have been minority candidates in most of the, uh, most of the neighborhoods in this district, in this city. I know how this city works. Like, you know, one of the reasons why Staten Island uh, took almost four years to get the Sandy money in, it's because of these politicians in here creating a mess for procurement. During the 9-11, uh, they just gave a lump sum money to the city to get it uh, repaired. Uh, about 20% of it was stolen. So the politicians went in and said, we're going to create all these safeguards. What happens? Now we're spending about 50 cents on every dollar delaying rebuilding things because they said, we got to save that 20, uh, 20, uh, 20 cents, so now we're spending 50 cents and it's delaying helping people. I know this stuff because I worked for DOT. I saw that. But I still think, go to my website, Michael, uh, electmikec.com. You will see a lot of issues there that I think you'll like. You'll, you'll understand where I'm coming from. Uh, and this is a situation with these few uh, seconds and minutes, I can't explain a lot more of what I would like to. But thank you for inviting me here. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, sir. Thank you for coming. Uh, I don't have a special connection uh, to Staten Island, but I'm very happy to be here today. So um, I appreciate you all having me here and inviting me to this forum and letting me tell you a little bit more about myself um, and why I am running for um, public advocate. I am a proud Democrat, and I think that's important to say in this moment in time. Um, and I am somebody that is a real believer that uh, government is a force for good, but only if it works. Um, that is why I am running for public advocate, because I think it's a critical role to make sure that city government works on behalf of average New Yorkers. We've talked a lot of different themes here. I think the, uh, there is an important thread here about people who are actually running for this job, um, public advocate and people who are actually running for mayor. And I think you guys, you're, you're all sophisticated consumers, you can tell the difference. Um, Melissa mentioned some of the litigation um, that she'd like to, like to bring. I think it's important that the next public advocate be an attorney. Um, there are now, um, at last count, I think 23 uh, candidates, you have plenty to choose from, um, and uh, there is, I am an attorney, I am a litigator, I am a partner at a law firm here in the city, and I think that's an important qualification for an office that has limited powers to make sure that the person there um, can fully uh, utilize all of the uh, tools that are, are made available to it. Um, so, again, um, I thank you for having me, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. All right, let's thank our candidates for one more.
I would first start with our presentation question is we know it's not easy to come out here and talk to us. So thank you. We hope to see you uh, a ton over the next few years. Whether you win or lose it, you're always invited back in the island. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, colleague Chris Marte, and we have a bunch of candidates now for round two. We uh, implore you to stay as our folks have come uh, from far and wide around the city to come talk to you. Uh, and we also encourage you to keep those spirits up and, and the good and the bad. If you like something, feel free to let somebody know. And if you disagree with it, folks can handle it. Uh, the later it gets, the more I want it. I want you to pump that energy up. I'm looking at you, Ernie. Um, all right, Chris, go for it. So we'll just make this a smooth transition. We'll just take three minutes. Uh, if you want to talk to any of the candidates that just vote, speak outside of the auditorium, so we'll just this from the next uh, round of candidates. Awesome. Um, thank you, everyone, who just arrived, and thank you for people here for the first round. Uh, just like the first round, we have an amazing slate of candidates here. Uh, we have Fan Yi, who's state committeeman of the 65th Assembly District, 66, uh, in Lower Manhattan. We have uh, Assembly Member Michael Blake and DNC Vice Chair. Uh, we have, I'm going to suffer this one, uh, E.P. Ike, uh, who's a uh, community activist, social activist, owns a consulting firm, and is an attorney as well. Uh, we have Rafael Espinel, who's a Brooklyn Council member, and we have Danny O'Donnell, who's an Assemblyman from the Upper West Side. Um, so thank you for all for being here. I'll go over the format one more time for people who just arrived. We're going to start with a two-minute opening statement. Each candidate will have two minutes. After that, we're going to have three response questions, and then we're going to have five quick yes or no questions where you raise your hand if you say yes. and. Don't raise it for now, and then we're going to give you a one-minute closing. Um, so let's start with Ben Yee's uh, two-minute opening. Thanks. Hey, everybody. I'm Ben Yee. Thank you all so much for coming out on a rainy night to hear about the candidates for public advocates. I got involved in politics 10 years ago when a man named Barack Obama said that if I engaged, things would change. And honestly, he was right. I got involved, and things have changed, but they didn't change the way I thought they would. I didn't go down to Washington, even though they had a job for me at Treasury. My friend on the campaign convinced me to get involved here in New York and be engaged in local politics. And that's where I learned about all of the hidden civic institutions that control our political lives, like county committees and community boards and community education councils. The list goes on about all the things that we need to be active in that nobody knows about and ways to engage and change our local government. Now, I was involved for a long time, and for the last 10 years, I've been advocating for the issues that matter to communities around this city. Out in Queens, fighting against cuts to the W train and Q train before it was cool. Down here in Staten Island, when the young Democrats called and said, we need folks to march with us for LGBTQ rights in the St. Pat's Day Parade. This was six years ago now, I was there. I was there the year after that, and when they asked most recently this past year, I was there for that too. I've been around this city for the last 10 years fighting for communities. And in the last two years in particular, with the surge in interest after Trump was elected, I started teaching civics volunteer all around New York, five boroughs, from Parkchester to Staten Island, Chinatown to the Rockaways, and I've seen people become leaders in their own communities with this simple civic knowledge. And that is what we need in a public advocate. So many of us are running, and most of us are right on any issue which you would care about. What you need to think about, what New Yorkers need to ask, is who has a theory of change to get us from where we are to where we need to be. Now, I think I have that theory of change. I have four concrete programs that use my experience as an organizer in opening up politics and government to citizens and residents of New York to empower communities. It starts with breaking down barriers to politics, government, bureaucracy, and it brings together communities to empower them in the fight in the, against City Hall for the things they care about. Now, these are serious policy proposals, so I don't have time to go into all of them now, but you can check them out on my website, benjaminyee.com slash platform, and I have handouts in the back because it is so critical that we have somebody who understands how to empower communities and makes that their focus. We need somebody more interested in, in 
We need somebody less interested in the public advocate and more interested in public advocacy. So if you want somebody who's going to bring more to the fight than words, I'm your candidate. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Michael Blake. Uh, I'm one of your candidates for public advocate. Thank you for having us here tonight. Uh, born and raised in the Bronx, New York. Son of a union household. My, my father was 1199 at CIU. He was a janitor at St. Martin's Hospital. My mother for 40 years. She raised four boys and worked at a manufacturing plant. I went to PS79-118 in D. Wicklitz High School uh, and overcame having a heart murmur and then fell asleep at the wheel in 2001. If it wasn't for the hands of God and the luggage in the car would have gone over the cliff on that day. I come to you as someone that wants to help more people. When I'm asked why am I running to be your public advocate, I want to focus on jobs and justice for the people, plain and simple. We want to find very concrete ways to help you in that aspect. I had the chance for about seven years to work for President Obama. I worked on both campaigns and also within the White House, overseeing the minority and women business portfolio at the White House in that aspect. What do we want to do in the role? Uh, number one, I believe public advocates should have a permanent seat on the MTA board to make it easier to be able to stand up when it comes to public transportation and access. You have seen so many challenges, especially when it comes to the bridges and buses and that many, many different ways, whether it be South Shore, Mid-Island, etc. Number two, I do believe we should be tracking the jobs that are happening for women and for people of color across our communities to ensure that opportunities are happening. If you're able to find $3 billion to invest in Amazon, you should be able to find money to invest in our small businesses. Uh, number three, we want to make sure we're addressing when it comes to community policing and engage in that way. Obviously, you know that very well given what happened with Eric Garner and the attentionness and the attentiveness on that detail. But beyond that, we want to find more ways to help more people. Uh, we have the opportunity to do that. Our website, Blake4NYC.com, will show more what we're trying to do. So I tied this together by saying this. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. If anyone wants to engage with us, we want to be attentive in what's going on. On Your Mark is a great organization that you all know of. Uh, we were able to make sure to engage in that way because of attentive issues that are happening, whether it be the opioid crisis, whether it be people with disabilities, and all those that are here in our respective communities. You understand that here in Staten Island, and that's what we want to do to give us the chance to be your next public advocate. My name is Michael Blake. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, everybody. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Ify Ike. Um, I, I hate, first of all, introducing myself, but I also, it's also worse when other people sometimes introduce you. So let me, let me introduce myself to say um, I am the former Deputy Executive Director for the Young Men's Initiative here in New York City. Um, I am also the former, uh, former congressional staffer who oversaw a lot of portfolio issues that had to deal with poverty, that had to deal with domestic issues like housing and transportation. And I also had the criminal justice and voter protection portfolio while in, in D.C. Um, I served on the Obama uh, campaign as a legal rights, uh, legal, legal voter rights protection attorney. Um, I say all those things, though, because I, I just want to let you know that my background in, in uh, law, but also in research and policy, I think is very critical to this position. But I'm also going to say that today I stand here proudly um, as not only the daughter of immigrant parents, um, one of which was a domestic worker that unfortunately did not have protections um, that many individuals enjoyed, and one who was a tag, uh, taxi cab driver and now is a security uh, officer. Um, that the reason why I'm running is because there are so many individuals that are in part of the majority that are hidden from the policies that are actually implemented in the city. I'm not saying that theoretically, I'm saying that as somebody who has worked on the inside and somebody who has also worked on the inside to ensure that oppression is actually taken down. Today actually marks the fourth anniversary of Millions March NYC, which I was actually behind the scene of that effort. But I was also behind the scene of a lot of efforts, including Just Leadership USA, which was a driving force to uh, ensure that Close Rikers was in actuality and that we weren't just talking about it. I was behind the scenes of working with uh, a young sister who's no longer here anymore, Erica Garner, who actually was the one that introduced her to Nina Turner um, and that led to her advocacy before she, she unfortunately died. Um, my time is running out. I do suggest that you go to ifyforNYC.com. Um, but I do think that in a city that is overwhelmingly women of color and a city, in a city that is overwhelmingly women, that it's important that this position is actually occupied by a woman. And I'm happy to talk more about how we can actually put equity in the seat moving forward. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Rafael Espinal. I'm a city councilman from Brooklyn. I was born and raised in Cypress Hills to immigrant parents. 
Uh, Cypress Hills is one of those neighborhoods that have been often ignored by city and state government. So Staten Island, I feel your pain. Uh, so uh, I ran for city council because I wanted to address that. You know, growing up in a neighborhood that's been ignored left me uh, and my constituents with a lot of desire. We wanted the same things everyone else wanted. We wanted uh, a, a safe neighborhood. We wanted access to fresh fruits and vegetables. We wanted a clean environment. We wanted good schools. Uh, and this, this, my time in the city council, I've been able to deliver over a quarter of a billion dollars to Cypress Hills in East New York, historic investments that the neighborhood has never seen before. Uh, I've also, in as city council member, been able to hold the mayor accountable. Uh, I was one, I was the first uh, Democratic elected official to stand up against the mayor on one of his key programs. I fought back against the horse carriages. I don't know how you feel about that, but it just shows that I wasn't afraid to stand up and, and protect uh, a vital part, one of our city's historical fabric, but also a industry that employed 300 union workers. Uh, I also stood up against the mayor when he wanted to build affordable housing in my district. He just wanted to build housing and not address the socioeconomic issues that my, my community was facing with. That's how I got the quarter billion dollars when he only wanted to get 50 million dollars. Uh, I, I also am known for being one of the creative members of the city council. Worked a lot around environmental issues, worked around a lot around uh, repealing the cabaret law, make dancing legal in New York City, and create the Office of Nightlife to protect our mom and pops and great uh, establishments across all five boroughs. Uh, as a public advocate, I want to expand on that work. I think it will give me the platform I need to make sure that the issues that matter to us most are being addressed. The city's falling apart. It's getting harder and harder to live here. We need to make sure New York City continues the best city in the country. One, we'll focus on the environment. Two, we're focused on making sure that labor is being heard. Uh, there's a great bill I have called the right to disconnect, meaning you can disconnect, disconnect your phone after you leave work without getting fired. Uh, there's another bill, I, there's other things I want to work on uh, that I'd love to get to at the end of, before the end of this year. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Danny O'Donnell and I want to be your advocate. I want to be your advocate because I've been an advocate my entire life. I happen to have a very famous sister, and people think that with fame comes all this comfort, but what you need to know is my family had to overcome an awful lot. My mother died when I was 12. We had to cook for ourselves and clean for ourselves. My father drank a bottle of whiskey a night for 18 months, and we were on our, on our own. And I can tell you this, if it wasn't for the city of New York, I wouldn't be here. Because the city of New York had a public law school I could afford to, and I became a lawyer. I went on to become a public defender in Brooklyn for 87 to 95, and I am now a member of the New York State Assembly, and I'm the, the Assembly's leading expert on criminal justice reform. But I'm also the first openly gay man ever elected to this job. And I was told, you can't be that. They won't let you be that. But guess what? New York let me be that. And I got to Albany, and I changed things. I wrote and passed the Marriage Equality Law. I wrote and passed the Dignity for All Students Act, the first time we acknowledge that trans people exist. Those are very, very important things. I, I, for four years, I was chair of the Corrections Committee. When you give me a job, I do it. In four years, I went to 38 state prisons. 38. And I went and I talked to the people who were there. I've been to Rikers so often in my life, I can't even count. So I understand those problems as well as anyone who could have a job. What do you need to be? One, outspoken, click, got that covered. Two, independent. Independent from who? Independent from the mayor, from the governor, from all the powers that be. So you can stand up when, when, when you see BS, you get to call BS. And you want someone who has a record of doing that in their life. For 16 years, I've been a public servant. I'm a full-time legislator. I have no outside income. I have a record to run on and proof that I have the ability to stand up to the powers that be. Thank you very much. Uh, so when we solicited questions from community groups around Staten Island and around the city, uh, the most common response we got was uh, skepticism around the office itself. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the first question we have uh, is, and this relates to, I think there's been some activity on the council, uh, at least threats to get rid of the office of public advocate. Uh, putting aside, the mayoral ambitions of people who might want to get rid of this office and prevent any of you from being a threat to them, uh, address the substance of the claim uh, that the office shouldn't exist. Uh, we could pretend like there's an empty seat of you know, the advocate to get rid of the office. What would you say uh, against that position? 
Well, first of all, as a matter of law, the city council cannot do it. It has to be done by amending the city charter. Two, I don't listen to what Reverend Diaz says about anything, because he's a homophobic bigot, and so I have no interest in hearing what he has to say on any subject. Third, I would have bought that before Donald Trump. But what we have is ever-expanding executive power where executives think they can decide everything. You just look at that Amazon deal, and what was it? Executives just decided. Rather than going to a community and saying, what do you need, what do you want, how can I help you? They said, we're going to announce one day that we're going to do this. We're going to spend $3 billion of your money. Did anyone ask you how you want that money spent? No. So the reality is that our nation and our state and our city are creeping towards ever-expanding executive power. And we in the city of New York are fortunate to have a city charter that has a job called the public advocate that has to be the person to check in that power. That's what I would say. to follow that. Um, but anyways, <laughs> um, I, I really do believe it's an important position. I would question anyone who wants to see a position that has oversight over a body, over agencies, or over their work. Right? Why don't we need an extra watchdog to make sure the city is working the way it should be working and addressing the issues that matter to us most? We, we, are, we, all, we all know that, that there's a lack of leadership coming out of City Hall. There's a lack of vision. Uh, every time the mayor and the governor want to uh, uh, bicker and fight over issues, our voice gets lost in the process. Public advocate should be the person who's laying out the vision when that's happening. I think that we have to make sure that the office stays in place so that we can have someone who's going to hold these agencies and, and these people accountable. The, 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 the thing we have to think about most, sorry, this is like that, sorry, <laughs> got a little nervous there. All right, I, 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 what we need to make sure is that we, we, we keep the office. And the reason that the office hasn't worked in the past is because there have been people who, who saw it as a springing board to run for the next thing. Tish James, I love her, she passed a lot of legislation, but she was quiet on a lot of key issues. Bill de Blasio used it to run for mayor. Uh, other folks didn't speak up a lot, a lot when the issues were when the issues of uh, in the past. We need to make sure we have someone who's not looking to run for mayor. We need to have someone who's going to hold these agencies accountable and move our city forward. As a New Yorker, I'm afraid of the way we're heading. I want to make sure that people can want to still live here, want to move here, and can still consider New York the best city in the country. So we need this position. I'm going to mention two key areas why we need this position. Amazon was mentioned, and when I think about the independence of what this space need, needs to, how this space needs to look at Amazon, I am concerned that we are starting from the position of when the governor and when the mayor were speaking, and we're not looking a year back as to the elected officials that actually signed a letter to invite Amazon to come here. This morning, I sat with my brother, who used to work at Amazon for six months, and he talked to me about what happened and how he lost 40 pounds in six months. And he talked to me about the extended, what was supposed to be just a Black Friday extension for a month period, how that turned into three months of indefinite overtime that was mandatory. And I say all this to say that a public advocate doesn't get to decide today that they're going to advocate on behalf of individuals. That a public advocate should actually have a record of ensuring that equity is the priority of people that are on the ground. And that individuals are not voiceless, but that voices are intentionally not being brought to the table. And I think that that's something that we're missing, especially here in Staten Island. This is not my first time being in Staten Island. We know that income divide is actually increasing. We know that when we talk about public health, that healthcare allocations are not coming to Staten Island the way that it needs to. And the reality is a lot of individuals here are using their elected positions as the reason why they should be in this space. My question as an independent thinker is, what were the electeds doing when these issues were happening? And what were the decisions and the decision making that took place? A public advocate actually needs to be in the space of being able to ask those questions and then to create a system as to how we report to the community about what those responses are. Um, finally, as my time is winding down, I also want to mention that the individuals that you did mention all happen to be men. And unfortunately, we live in a city where a lot of men make decisions about what, when they decide that something is not important, that they want to get rid of it. In a city that is 53% women, this position actually has to understand that equity is not a buzzword, that we don't fly to DC to say, believe survivors, but we have survivors here that we're not prioritizing. You have many reasons why the public advocate position needs to stay. 
Well, let's, let's break this down. When you think about uh, the conversations on housing, in particular public housing, where on today we are wondering and, and wondering and wondering yet again, why do people not have heat and hot water? Why you have individuals that across our city are getting water out of fire hydrants because NYCHA is not being ran correctly. When you think about when it comes to sanitation, why is it that they couldn't have anything prepared when it came to a six inch snowstorm and you were able to fire someone within three days, but you haven't been able to fire the people that actually have been suffering our city for decades. This is an opportunity for us to figure out how do we go a step further. The public advocate has particular roles that people may not realize. Number one, you sit on the NICERS board, which is the position that oversees what's happening for New York City employees and the pension that you receive. 400,000 people that need a determination of who's going to be able to fight for you. Number two, the oversight that's happening consistently. I think we've seen time and time again, whether it become public hospitals, public education, transportation, sanitation, elections, I think it's pretty clear what we saw on election day, the absolute crisis that happened across the city because of lack of preparation. You have to understand who's going to be able to fight for you. Now, I come to you as someone that's from the South Bronx regularly and oh, too many times. People forget about what's going on in our communities. They don't want to respect our communities. They don't want to focus on what happens in our communities every single day. The reason why you have to have this role right now is people have to fight for you. And what's going on with de Blasio and the leadership that he has there and the lack of leadership in many aspects, they're not helping you. They're not stepping up for you. They're not stepping up in many different ways. You think about how a week ago, the fact that Pantaleo finally was coming forward when it came to the, the, the CCRB for the possibility for action. It's pretty ridiculous that you can have these activities happening this way. So you need this office, but more importantly, it's about who's going to keep fighting for you. When we talk about jobs and justice, that's not a tagline. What we think about, that's our passion. That's our consistency. That's how we think about this. And lastly on this, it's pretty ironic that the individuals that were talking about trying to eliminate the office, that one of them was talking about running for office, one of them actually didn't have other friends that wanted to do this, and the other one is saying they actually think the office should be strengthened. That's the games that we don't have time for. You've seen that too often in Staten Island. We see that in the Bronx, and that's where we want to run right now. So not too long ago, there was a runoff election for public advocate between Dan Squadron and Letitia James. And I went to Facebook and I said, why have a runoff election? It would be cheaper to just hire both of them. And it's true. And why not? because the public advocate doesn't really have a lot of power. It's not like they'll get in each other's way. Got a lot of likes. Now, the situation is such that the public advocate doesn't really have that much to do, and it's a very amorphous role. It doesn't have any budgetary power. It has minimal legislative power. It doesn't have any executive power. So what good is it? Well, as far as I'm concerned, the public advocate's office needs a new vision for how it's going to operate. When you don't have legislative power, when you don't have budgetary power, when you don't have executive power, the only thing left to you is political power. And political power means people. Now the reason that everybody views the public advocate's office as a springboard is that it's so easy for a politician to occupy a position where they can agree with everybody and be held accountable for nothing. They come and they say, I agree with you, and if the thing that you want happens, they say, I was part of that fight. And if the thing that you want to happen doesn't happen, they say, the city council didn't want it, or the mayor didn't want it. Again, the question that New Yorkers have to ask themselves is who has a theory of change that takes you from a public advocate to the issue you care about to success for your community? And I have that. I have metrics by which you could judge a successful public advocate, and it means that I'm putting myself on the line. I'm not going to come here and just say, I like your issue and I like your issue, and there's nothing I can physically or factually do about it. Four programs. It starts with civic education. I've been teaching civics around the city for the last two years. We need civics for everybody because knowing how the city works is how you take on entrenched power. Mm -hmm. Two, reverse it. Not everybody can go to a civics lesson. I know that. It takes time. It's a privileged thing. You need a place where you can call that will give you the civic knowledge you need to solve the problems in your community. Three, bring together civic institutions to build bottom-up community planning, and four, expand the ligatory actions of the public advocate to include systemic bad actors like the Board of Elections and the government itself. I want to talk to you more about this. Find me afterwards. the next question. This is a question from the Staten Island March. 
Staten Islanders have some of the longest daily commutes in the country. Man, if you come from, I think most of our folks, everybody came from somewhere else in the city, you get a taste of that, just coming here to see us. Uh, we have limited rail service and are the only borough with no subway connecting us to the rest of the city. Express bus service to Manhattan is inadequate and unreliable. While the mayor has promised new fast ferries for every borough, somehow Staten Island was left out of the plan. Improving transportation could vastly improve the lives and job prospects of Staten Island's half million residents. As public advocate, what will you do to ensure that Staten Island gets its fair share of New York City's transportation resources? There's, there's no one that can say they have a similar connection to you because we deal with this kind of frustration in the Bronx all the time and the lack of transportation access. When you have someone in Larry Schwartz on the MTA who said last week that they showed up to an MTA meeting late because he didn't know how the buses work. <laughs> Just internalize that for a second uh, in that manner. That's one of the reasons that I've been very consistent out the gate. That I do believe the public advocate should have a permanency on the MTA board so that you can actually help make some of these things changes and these happen. Now, how do you practically do this? Obviously, when it comes to bridges, when it comes to tolls, when we think about what's happened, the first piece that we worked on in a very granular way, the select bus service that we ha had to make happen up in the Bronx, we want to replicate that elsewhere. And why does that make sense? Because too many times if you keep telling someone, I hope you can make it by you driving around, I hope you can make it by getting across that bridge, well you have to actually have to expand different opportunities to make it easy for somebody. That's number one. Number two, this is a question around priorities. And I, I will respectfully disagree about having lack of power. Leadership steps up regardless of the budget. So the notion that we can't make things happen because of what has happened in the past, that is not the vision that we need to have on this aspect. I do believe transportation and transportation access and transportation equity has to be one of the determinations on how we decide on this next seat. And that's one of the things we want to work on. When you think about what's going to come up as it relates to the budget, as it relates to bridges, as it relates to tolls, and especially how do you connect what's going on throughout Staten Island, North Shore, Mid Island, South Shore. In order to be able to achieve this, I think in large part, it has to be through the MTA and transmission what happens in the MTA through this board. That was good. <laughs> so I want to start off by saying that um, there are actually quite a few things that I agree with with Assemblymember Blake. But I also want to ensure that the public advocate is also educating the public about when we say we need somebody on the board, that we understand what the board is actually charged with right now, the MTA, which we need to challenge. The MTA board is not there to improve the lives of individuals' commutes. The MTA board is there to basically ensure that the MTA itself is making money and that the MTA is taken care of. And that is important and I think that the public advocate can actually advocate for a repurposing of an MTA that also has a relationship between the city and the state and that a public advocate should definitely take not only the hardship of what it means to take different buses to get to work, but the key word that I do think has been used a lot is the word equity. And we don't talk a lot about how transportation cannot be siloed from housing, how transportation can't be siloed from income inequality, and that transportation is also an issue that impacts children differently depending on where you live. Too many of our issues are seen as single issue issues, right? Audre Lorde says that we are whole people, so we have to look at the way we operate in a holistic fashion. And I think that a public advocate that comes in without an understanding of how inequity actually deals with our lives and that this system was made by design is actually going to come in and add to the problem, thinking that the MTA is actually the place where we make solutions. So I would. I, I will stop. By the way, shout out to uh, Tony for being really good about time. Uh, every one of you have been excellent with this. Thank you. I mean, a lot of the great points have been hit already. I, I agree a lot with what was said. I do believe the public advocate should have a seat uh, at the table on the board. Um, but I know that that cannot be done alone. And I think the public advocates have to work with the people of New York City to make sure that the MTA governor and the mayor understand this is what New York City wants. We want a seat at the table. So we need to work together to make that happen. Uh, when it comes to ferry service, the MTA doesn't, doesn't control the ferries. The city does. EDC does. They should be doing their job. They promised more ferry service in Staten Island. They haven't delivered. The public advocate has to make sure they fight to get, to get that extra ferry service as well. Those are the things I'm going to focus on. Those are the things I'm going to push forward. Those are the things we're going to make happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Remember when the mayor ran for office, he said this is a tale of two cities? Yeah. What we now have is a divided city. The mayor has divided the city into parts. So he promised more ferries. 
and he delivered all the ferries to where the rich real estate developers have property in Long Island City. He proposes a tram to go from Brooklyn to Queens with, without bringing a single ferry to the island that needs it the most. It's the most insane thing that I've ever heard. Now, the reality is transportation all across the city is problematic. It's problematic where I live and represent as well. But your problems should be the first place that is addressed. And I'm tired of seeing ribbon cuttings where they pat themselves off the back, on the back because 22 people can ride across the East River. That's not really helping the problem, folks. Okay, so we need to do something more and grand. I certainly think the MTA board should have the public advocate, and I agree with most of my comments. My first job when I came back from college was working for the Transportation Workers Union as an analyst, and I would go to every single MTA board meeting. It's like 15 people, and one time there was the sole uh, member appointed as a strap hanger representative who said, who rides the subway? And he was the only guy who raised his hand. One. My father was working for the MTA and the Port Authority for his entire life. I could go on and on about the policies that we need to enact to both fund the MTA and DOT and the solutions that will get us to transit equity, including reduced bus fares, more uh, ferries, trams, which are not bad, we just need more options. But I'm not going to, because when candidates for this office say, I'm going to put your issues first, or I'm going to push that when I become public advocate, what does that mean? So I want to talk about the policies that I proposed, which are the four programs to engage people in their own civic institutions and build power for communities. Because the state government controls the MTA, our city government controls DOT, and what our elected officials do is what determines how we're serviced. Which means that if we want solutions to our problems, we need to make sure people understand how the system works. We need to make sure they understand and that it is easy to engage in the political process. We need to take down barriers to the bureaucracy of this city and make sure that elected officials are forced to hear what our communities care about. And that is why I have four programs to do that. Thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, the next question. This is uh, submitted by Staten Islanders Against Racism and Police Brutality. It's been reported that the NYPD maintains a gang database. Local community groups here on Staten Island have raised questions about the transparency of that database. What will you do as public advocate to reform that system, and what else will you do to improve the relationship between the NYPD and communities of color? So, um, this is an area that I, I feel very strongly about. As a public advocate, I think that there is um, not only space with um, the way we share information and the way we review data within the city. Um, I also think that uh, without knowing if this in fact does exist, I will operate as if it does exist. The reality is that um, with certain agencies, whether it's MOCJ, whether it's uh, uh, the CCRB, whether it's all these agencies that claim that they are saying that they're doing things in equity and for safety, we have to understand that we have a history of saying that tools are there for safety reasons and they're actually there for surveillance reasons. And that is nothing new. I think as public advocate, there are a couple things that we could do. The number one is we can show how past prior programs, whether it's Cointel Pro, whether it's the way that we use agency funding to surveil black and brown communities and also poor communities. Um, that we actually use the position to educate uh, the public about how this impacts all New Yorkers. Because the reality is sometimes we look at policing as just a black and brown issue and we don't talk about how it actually impacts all of us. And we're investing in these issues and we need to make a decision as to whether or not we're going to continue investing in dis the disparity that some of our neighbors are experiencing. Um, I'll just end with this. I think one of the things that the public advocate can also do is also uh, talk a little bit about the budget. Uh, support and speak with council members about what are the monies that we're investing. Um, we had some individuals in the last panel that now were saying that they weren't part of some of these programs that now are saying that they would support um, but having some type of investigation, I would want us to look a little deeper into also how elected officials and city council members are um, investing in database, data, databases to surveil our communities. Thank you. Uh, 
so I grew up in East New York, uh, where we have the largest police precinct in the city, the 75th precinct. Uh, we have most crime, most stop and frisks. All of the issues you can think of, we've had the highest numbers. Uh, but I still don't believe that that gives the NYPD the right uh, to um, infringe on the rights of the people of my community. Uh, if there's a database, the pu public advocate has the power to introduce legislation. The legislation should give the public advocate more power and so they can have more transparency over the, what the NYPD is doing. Yes, we love the NYPD to keep us safe. But at the same time, there's a lot of corruption within the agency that needs to be looked at. And let's be real, if Mayor de Blasio was to trip and fall or catch a heart attack, who becomes the mayor? The public advocate. And we need to have someone who's going to be uh, readily uh, accessible, ready, and have knowledge of what's going on with these agencies and be able to address those problems if they, if they end up taking that office. Uh, so I do believe that there should be more transparency, and the public advocate has the power to choose legislation to make that happen, and that's something I'm also going to look at as a councilman as well. Thank you. As a member of the assembly, I have conducted a number of investigations. The most important thing to get to the truth is uh, the power to subpoena. And so the first bill I intend to introduce when I'm public advocate is to give the public advocate subpoena power. And once you have subpoena power, you can get to the bottom of whatever the problem is or the issues are because subpoenas have to be complied with. As I said earlier, I was a full-time public defender for seven years in Brooklyn. I understand the way the system works, and I understand the way the system doesn't work. Um, I also represent part of a district where there is a significant gang problem, so I'm not saying that that's not an issue. But we need to do better than that. We cannot live by guilt by association. Okay, so you end up with somebody seen walking down the street or seen near someone who may or may not be somebody who's up to no good. You can't tar them for the rest of their lives and claim that they're a gang member because of it. And so um, I know this issue very well. I uh, work very well with the youth people who deal with people who are in the criminal justice system to reduce gang influence in their communities. But in the end, we can't tar everyone together. It's the wrong thing to do. And if I'm a public advocate, I will investigate. Thank you, Ben. So I actually come from a tech background. When I was on the Obama campaign, I was digital director for New York State, managed the databases. When I was in the New York State Senate, I worked with the Chief Information Officer doing open government and transparency work. Now, as far as I'm concerned, there's two types of data, particularly when it comes to public data and data collected by the government. There is data which is transparent and accessible by voters, and there is dangerous data. Now, that doesn't mean that we can make every piece of data the government collects available to every person, but it does mean that the government needs to take a philosophy of openness and transparency if we're going to protect communities. So, if this database were to exist and I were to be public advocate, it would be a primary responsibility to go in there and figure out how this data is being used and, if necessary, file lawsuits to ensure that that data were available to representatives to represent our community if, in fact, it could not be released generally. This is an incredibly important issue. It's not one that is limited to government, but it is one that is if especially important when we're talking about the government. So, data, while it is important for our decision-making processes, is equally important to be transparent to the public. When the government is collecting information on you, you have a right to know. Thank you, Ben. Uh, something to like. We can talk about data, but let's talk about the root issue. Let's talk about the criminalization that happens in communities over and over. Let's talk about how folks are being arrested and harassed and attacked uh, purely because of their skin color and their zip code. And so we can, we can talk that through, but we have to talk about the transparency that has to happen around criminal justice reform as a whole in all different aspects of it. I think very well, people from Staten Island, the same way we think about from the Bronx, whether it be Eric Garner for you, whether it be Khalid Brock for us, there's an understanding that there's an injustice that has been institutionalized. I believe someone said in the previous panel about how what, there's not institutionalized racism, that's kind of absurd to even say that in any aspect. Uh, you know, so like that's just ridiculous. Yeah, you get everybody to wake up right? here. So, so <laughs> in that framing. So the, the, the tracking of data, in which it is happening, let's make sure we are being clear about that. It is wrong, it is unacceptable, and I think one of the things public advocate has to work on, and if you give us a chance to be that, is to look at how can you use the law and how do you sue to protect and stand up for residents so you're not having data being released and quite frankly you're not being harassed for the perception of being in a gang. As someone who has experienced police brutality not once but not but twice, 
as someone who has had two family members who have been incarcerated. Too often not, it's because someone thought I was in the wrong place. Someone thought I was doing the wrong thing. And you get attacked and your entire livelihood is destroyed within seconds. And so, rather than us ignoring the root causes of it, we have to be real about that. I tie this together by saying this. The first two months of next year, in, in the Assembly and in the Senate, there will be criminal justice reforms that are happening around speedy trial, around open discovery, etc. But this is about being consistent in this manner. And I want to tie this together and give credit to someone. Matt Tatone, your incoming circuit court judge, someone who stood up in many different aspects, where he moved forward on legislation to have transparency in what happened around Eric Garner, so you know what those grand juries were doing. We were a co-sponsor of that legislation, and we worked on that in that aspect with Cusick and others. It's the understanding that data tells the truth when you uh, push forward on it, but we have to be more consistent about the root causes in the first place. Thank you. So our next, uh, next series of questions, we're going to give you seven questions. They're just statements that you raise your hand if you associate with the statement, so if you believe it. Uh, as with our last group, you know, things are nuanced. If you just want to shout any explanation out, go for it. Um, so the, the first framing comes from the Staten Island Women Who March. In Staten Island, there are neighborhoods where local schools are wholly inadequate at educating our children, yet the families have no other options that would enable their children to get a quality education. Often, opponents of school choice focus on restricting choice for low-income families while leaving untouched our vast system of neighborhood preferences and private magnet schools. So question one on this is, raise your hand if you support the mayor's uh, expanding discovery program to reform admissions to specialized high schools. But, 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 but you get a nuanced, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As I'm saying, yeah, like, yeah, go for it. Complex go for it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Not the mayor's plan, the concept of right. it. Yes, because the way specialized high schools inherently are created is discriminatory right. and keeps certain kids out of actually pursuing a quality, equitable education. Mm -hmm. It's not the mayor's plan. And I think there's a lot of people that, you know, so we're not I agree with it. Okay. Great, thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Go for it, man. Uh, I think what's really lacking is a plan for all education. And so when we talk about the fact that there aren't good schools in a particular area, we also need a mayor and an elected body that is going to fund all of our schools at 100% of the city's proposed metric. Uh, right now, that doesn't happen. It's not even at 90% for most schools. All right, thank you. Second question, uh, raise your hand if you support uh, the expansion of public charter schools. So raise your hand if you support the expansion of public charter schools. Third, raise your hand if you think the mayor had adequate grounds to fire the commissioner of the Department of Edu uh, Investigations, Mark Peters. So raise your hand if you think the mayor had adequate grounds to fire the commissioner of the Department of Investigations. Again, Mark, nuanced. It is nuanced. I agree with that. But Mark Peters withheld a, a report which criticized him from the city council and the mayor because by law, that report could only be submitted to the investigator. And that's just wrong. That's an abuse of power, in my opinion. It's it's not, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> so, so, sorry. Now, this no, is no, great. No, no, keep going. Don't worry about me. I think I'll be uh, done. The coffee has worn exactly. off. There are two issues with that. The reason why it's nuanced, what you asked, was whether or not the mayor had appropriate grounds to do what he did, which is separate from the issues that we have with the individual. So that aside, he literally went around processes that were there to go through that firing. So the firing itself is problematic. We can talk about the individual that we have a problem with, but there, there, there are two wrongs that exist in that situation. And I think we have to articulate that to the public um, because when we don't do that, we actually absolve other parties from their wrongdoing. And we actually have to balance the wrongdoing that happened on both sides. Just to yeah, there's someone in Blake and then uh, someone in Donald. Danny had his hand up first, I wrote the day. Go for it, Danny, go. Respectful. The day he was fired, I called on us to change this and make that job an appointee of the public advocate. And the reality is, is that job is to investigate city appointees and people the mayor put there. And so there's an inherent conflict of interest. We should separate them out. Thank you. So one, 100% agree. Two, it, it also demonstrates the mayor's lack of priorities when it comes to actually helping people. So you, you fire the person that you are upset may do something to make you look bad, but you won't fire anyone on one night when they lie about lead. Right. right? You, 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 you won't go after those that have been covering up instances. Like So the reality is it was a decision of I'm upset this person may embarrass me as opposed to actually helping people. All right. Um, raise your hand if you've publicly criticized the mayor by name in the past month. Uh, <laughs> um, 
let me just say I used a hyphenated word. <laughs> so I, I follow up on that. I was thinking about this since we asked the last one. Uh, Raise your hand if you publicly criticized the mayor in his first six months in office, assuming that you were a public figure back then. Um, okay. Um, raise your hand if you endorsed uh, pre-primary the challengers to the Independent Democratic Conference, uh, the Democrats who caucus with you. Um, raise your hand uh, if you think uh, Officer Pantaleo should remain on the job. Should remain, should remain on the job. Um, raise your hand is the final question, and then we'll give folks an opportunity to close. Uh, raise your hand if you pledge not to run for mayor in 2021, if you win this election. If you win this election. No, but I do think, because this has come up in a lot of forms, and Raphael did mention this, and this is an important point. It is in the charter that if the mayor were to step down, the public advocate becomes mayor temporarily. So we have to be nuanced about that, but that is tied to the question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so with that, we have uh, an opportunity for y'all to close. I think Councilman Espinosa, I think you're the only one who has gone first. So uh, why don't you go for it? And you know what we're asking is if you have, and it's okay if you don't, but if you have a particular connection or story about Staten Island, it's it's always helpful to close with that. Uh, but if you don't, that's all right. I'm a huge fan of Letty's Tavern. I love the pizza there. Uh, a few other places I have to go check out. I'm going to do that as well. Uh, but I think this election is really about the future of our city. Um, as we've mentioned earlier, we know night is crumbling, the MTA is crumbling, there's no clear plan in place on how we're going to address the issues that matter to us most. It's getting harder and harder for us to live here. You're either being squeezed out or you're choosing to leave because of how hard it is to live in this city. We have to change that narrative. We have to take back New York City and make sure we're protecting its culture, the people who are responsible for that, making sure it's a place that we're proud of and it's easy for us to live in. I think the public advocate can play an important role and making sure that, that that conversation is being driven forward, that we're able to cut through the clutter, that when leadership is lacking, that they're able to stand up and speak for the people. And again, that could, not, that could only happen if the people stand behind the public advocate. And I promise you, as public advocate, I will organize New York City, make sure our voices are heard, and every time government decides to move on action, that we make sure it's moving in the, in the best interest of the people of New York City. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm currently the chair of the Arts and Tourism Committee, and I have toured cultural institutions here on Staten Island. My staffer is from Staten Island, so she insists I try the pizzas. So I've been to Danino's and Lee's. I haven't made it to Pat and Joe's or Joe's and Pat's or whatever one that is. But I personally, I just want you to know, I'm more of a Danino's guy. I just want to share that with you. That's my personal thing. Um, listen, what I would like to say is, this job is important and it matters to you and there's a role to be played for someone who's willing to criticize and speak out against abuses wherever they exist. After the Eric Garner case was not indicted, I put a bill the next day into the assembly and it said something very simple. That we the people should have the right to know what the DA says to the grand jury. Because I heard him, the police officer, at a press conference just say, I didn't intend, I didn't intend, I didn't intend. And as a, as a criminal lawyer, I know what that means. Because most laws require intent, but there are some crimes that don't. And so we, the people, should be allowed to know what our elected officials, like the DA, does in a grand jury. I've been a fighter all my life. I have fought for gay rights. I have fought for LGBT rights in every way you could possibly. I'm a manager, a plaintiff in the marriage lawsuit, I'm a trailblazer, I'm afraid of no one. And I'd be very proud to be your public advocate. A lot of being a public advocate or any sort of elected official is showing up. And I've been doing that, not because I have to, but because I want to for the last 10 years. Including Staten Island, I've been here many, many times for the runs, for fighting for LGBTQ rights, for con, con discussions, and now. But I've been doing that all around the city. I've been teaching civics classes and showing up and fighting for equitable transportation and taxation and uh, anti-hydrofracking and for the environment and for seawalls all over the place because we need our government to do things. Now we have a lot of great candidates in this race. I agree with pretty much all the answers we've 
for tonight. I like all of the other folks running. For the most part, I just do the Independence Party guy, and I, I <laughs> don't dislike him per se, but I don't agree with most of what he said. What I will say again is what I said at the beginning, which is that New Yorkers have to ask themselves a question, and that question should be, what is the theory of change to get from where we are to where we want to be? And who has the plan and the program to do that? And that is what I'm bringing to the table. We can say all the nice words we want to say. And we can say we're not going to run for mayor. And we can say that we're going to put your issues first. And we can say all of these things. But we all know that the city has big challenges ahead of it. And there's not an easy way to solve these challenges. And sometimes the interests of one community will conflict with the interests of another. So do you have a philosophy, a program, a plan for sorting through these issues that is fair and equitable and builds power for all communities so that they can get what they need from the government? So that when the mayor plays the divide and conquer and says one day, I want to solve this problem by doing something this community doesn't want, all the other communities don't immediately turn around and say, yes, do it there because we don't want it. And then allows the mayor to come around the next day and say, I'm going to solve this problem by doing something this community doesn't want. And then all the communities turn around and say, yes, do it there, because we don't want it. What is the plan for your public advocate? Check out my website, benjaminyee.com slash platform, or come talk to me afterwards. I'm going to stick around. I want to answer your questions. Thank you again for having us tonight. From marching in the 4th of July parade with Tatone and Cusick and hanging on that aspect to uh, being at Denoyo last week and, and realizing you have some pretty good food out here. We have Little Italy brought you have to come hang out with us if that's all right. <laughs> to obviously supporting local nonprofits like On Your Mark and mobilizing with many and many local organizers. This is not my first time here in Staten Island. It won't be our last time. Uh, I am running very clearly because we want to fight for jobs and justice for the people. And when you think about the opportunity that we have, that's what we want to work on. I come to you again as a child from a union household, oldest brother served in the Army for 29 years. We understand what it's like. We want to focus on very specific things. How do we make sure we're helping minority women-owned businesses get access to jobs and capital they don't have like that? How do we actually stand up when it comes to the MTA so you can have good working transportation that's working in all different aspects? How do we stand up when it comes to criminal justice reform? Because we shouldn't be talking about building many right people around the city if you're actually not addressing the challenges in the first place. What do we do to stand up for our immigrant communities? As a son of Jamaican immigrants, it is personal for me on how we stand up in these different aspects. But this is the opportunity for us to step up, and this opportunity is to go help more people. And that's all we want to do. We want to continue to be your voice and your advocate. In the last four years that I've been in elected office, we've been able to specifically make changes happen. We change the law so that minority women-owned businesses are paid in 15 days instead of 30 days. Those are the below 300 employees. We change the law so that we can focus on the My Brother's Keeper program. We are still the only state in the country where young men of color are having the chance to actually go to school and graduate from school on time with additional support. We were able to work on Raise the Age so that 16, 17 year olds are not trying any longer, and we put in $250 million when they came to public housing this year. We have a track record, we have a vision, and we want to go a bit further. I am asking for your support. We are mobilizing, we are building. We have support all across the city, from Jeff Aubrey to Rebecca Seawright to the United African Coalition to Dick, Gav Dick Ravitch, our former lieutenant governor, who is supporting us because of the vision we want to make happen. My name is Michael Blake. We want to fight for jobs and justice. Our website is blakefornyc.com. I'm asking for your vote to be your next public advocate. Have a great night. So actually, before I, I walked in here, and I wish she was still here, I was working with some mental health advocates here in Staten Island. Uh, which I've been doing for this past year um, behind the scenes. And I say that intentionally because oftentimes individuals need titles to actually activate them to do something. As somebody who's been proud to be a co-drafter of several legislation, including the Federal and Racial Profiling Act, as an individual that was actually worked on building the uh, Caucus on Black Men and Boys, which actually led to My Brother's Keeper, but also wrote the grant in this state to ensure that Staten Island actually got money through the My Brother's Keeper grants that was allocated for the state of New York. As an individual who has worked with the, uh, Staten Island NAACP, but also connected with Erica Garner, who marched every Wednesday, regardless of whether 100 people showed up or nobody showed up. I think that when we talk about advocacy, I get very frustrated because we are talking about theory. I heard the word theory. People can't eat off of theory. I do encourage you all to really look at the backgrounds of individuals that are up here today and really look at what is it that motivated individuals to actually do the things that they were doing. 
I am here because I was actually on a project called Mass Bailout where we freed over 100 women and children from Rikers. No fanfare, we were not trying to do it to be seen. But we also contacted elected officials who were excited about being a part of the action so that they could then show that they were a part of the action. And that's problematic. That is how we run government here in New York City. We have individuals that run to the podiums and they run to the rallies, but they're not behind the scenes creating the rallies. They're not on the ground with the community members actually doing the work. And then we want to then reward them for the work that many of you all do, putting the sweat equity to make sure that the rally actually happens but that people also eat. And all I'm saying is that as an individual who has worked within Congress to create not one but two caucuses that now exist, as an individual who is in Ferguson as an attorney, there being shot out by law enforcement, as an individual who worked within city government yelling at the mayor and all his individuals, I'll use that as a nice word, um, that work in there to protect um, themselves from bad press from New York Post versus actually protecting themselves from what you all are thinking, I am not here as somebody who is the most eloquent. I'm here as an individual who has a background in research, data, activism, law, and not because of theories. Because as a black woman in New York City, I actually need to do those things to survive. I am here to ensure that you all are able to survive. This has nothing to do with me. I don't need this title. I've been doing this work for a very long time. But I think that as, when we were talking about vision, the vision of, if they say that the vision of, of the world or the future is female, and we're about to have three out of the four positions that are already occupied by white men and we're about to put another man and possibly somebody who's recycled that already is a politician in that one citywide seat, then the future of the city for New York City is not female. It's actually going to be the status quo. Thank you. Thank you. So, let's start by just giving a round of applause for all of our candidates for showing up today. I just want to note that our candidates were super respectful, not only of the time and each other, but also of the island to show up here, so thank you for your time. Uh, second, I want to uh, just note that we have another candidate who uh, has been uh, patiently sitting in the back, and Jamani Williams, uh, who showed up after we started the second session. So um, I imagine Jamani might stick around and answer any questions folks have, so you can find Jamani back there. Uh, finally, at the arena, we didn't talk, I didn't talk in the beginning a lot about what we're, we do, but we last cycle we supported over 50 candidates around the country, including a ton here in New York City. We led the effort against the IDC, and we raised and spent over a million dollars directly with candidates, and then another million dollars in state-level campaigns. This year, I'm glad it was very important to me, uh, so I came out. Just want to say thank you very much. I won't take too much of your time. As I mentioned, my name is Jamani Williams, Councilman of the 45th District. I just want to thank everybody who supported me uh, for the Lieutenant Governor's race. I really appreciate it. Uh, we did pretty good with $300,000 against $35 million. Uh, we came within 6%. We won New York City. Uh, and we got more votes than any non-white candidate ever in a statewide primary. So I want to say thank you. I know that was due to a lot of people in this room. When I ran for Lieutenant Governor, I said that I wanted that position to be the public advocate for the state. And so I'm now running for public advocate of New York City. Uh, it is not an amorphous office. It is a job that was created in 1989 by Mark Green. Uh, first public advocate, Mark Green, very proud to have uh, his endorsement. Uh, there were five things that they said the office can do. One is legislation, one is an ombudsman and watchdog over a city government, a charter cop to make sure that the agencies are doing the job they're supposed to be doing by charter mandate. One is to be uh, a vote on the pension board. One is to appoint individuals to commissions like the, to city planning. Those are very important things. Uh, I consider myself an activist elect official long before it was popular to be an activist. Uh, I wanted to show that you can be an effective activist elect official. I passed 51 pieces of legislation more than any city council member. I was voted the most productive council member uh, after the speaker uh, a few years back. I've always taken on issues before they were popular, whether it was stop pressure and frisk, legalization of marijuana, first person to publicly endorse uh, by Wall Street, Bernie delegate in a place that was very difficult to do so. I do think not because they are politically popular, but because it is the right thing to do. Uh, I would like to see this office be occupied by someone who has the vision, risk, and courage to take on folks. I know one of the questions is who is called out the mayor. I like to take it a step further because some folks 
call out those that are comfortable to them. So some folks call out the mayor, not the governor, some the governor, not the mayor. I have had the courage to call out everyone, including the leader of my own legislature. Uh, I am a sitting elected official, the only one who was willing to challenge, the strongest leader in this state. Uh, thankfully it worked out, I think we came out stronger, uh, but it's critically important that we have a public advocate. That when it was created, they said it rises above politics, uh, to be fair, I want to try to answer all the questions. Uh, I don't think the mayor should have fired the DOE uh, person, the same way that many of them said. Uh, if you read the McGovern report, it laid out the many things that were wrong with Mark Peters, and they gave remedies. None of them was firing. The mayor was looking for an excuse to do that, uh, and unfortunately, Mark Peters gave, an ex uh, gave him uh, an excuse to do so. Uh, I think there was a question about the SHACT. Um, I always want okay, I always want to make sure I went to Brooklyn Tech, I'm a public school baby for preschool and masters. I have Tourette syndrome, ADHD, made through the public school system, first generation American, uh, mother raised some nuclear children by herself. Uh, I would not have, my nickname was Promotion in Doubt and Needs Improvement in School, would not have had it anywhere else uh, without the SHAT. I want an access point, so maybe we have some SHAT, some multiple criteria. Uh, I think I've been a public advocate from when I was a tenant organizer to when I was a council member. I'm just asking folks to allow me to be the public advocate. I do apologize for my tardiness. I'll stick around if anyone has any questions. God bless everyone. Thank you.